Well, what's the difference between normal suturing and microsuturing? For one, we do not use the traditional needle holder with a ratchet type mechanism in the right hand when we do microsuturing. We typically use either a curved jeweler's forceps, which is used in many laboratories across the country to teach microsuturing techniques, or more commonly in the operating room, we will use the curved needle holder to drive the needle since it gives a more secure purchase on the needle when you're driving it through atherosclerotic vessels. The second main difference is that we don't hold the instruments similar to the needle holder, but we hold both instruments in the left hand, which is already being held with a pencil type grip. In the right hand now, we use a pencil type grip for the instrument. Now, to the outside observer, when doing microsurgery, it doesn't appear as though the microsurgeon is doing very much, and that's because the hands are not moving. The motion comes through the fingertips, and there's very minimal translation that occurs in order to accomplish the microsuturing. Okay. Now let's review some of the details of microsuturing seen from a macro perspective. I'm going to simulate using jeweler's forceps with two large forceps so I don't destroy our fine microsurgery instruments. Normally, when we're putting a needle in the needle holder in the operating room for normal surgery, we will pick up the needle or hold it with the another uh, instrument. And this really is almost impossible to do in microsurgery because, number one, you can't pick up the needle. And it's hard to grab it because it sometimes flies away. So first of all, one easy point in terms of picking the needle up is to grab the suture attached to the needle and spin the needle up in the air and then grab it about two-thirds of the way down. Okay, now passing the needle through in microsurgery does not involve picking up the tissue and, and then squeezing it because this will oftentimes crush the end of the tissue. We simply insert the forceps underneath and exert some pressure so that we can pass the needle in an atraumatic fashion. Now let's just review some of the details of making the loop. First of all, when making the loop in microsurgery, we don't want a big tail left behind because that will lead to entanglement. So we take it down until only a few millimeters of suture end are protruding from the end. Then we have to make the loop. Now if you happen to be using a jeweler's forceps, in this hand, the jaws of the jeweler's forceps are very fine and they can grasp the suture quite easily. However, if you are using a curved needle holder with larger jaws, this will cause difficulties in terms of picking up the end of the suture and an alternate technique is necessary for making the loop. But now, let's look at the tra traditional method for making the loop. The left hand turns palm down and grabs the suture, and a loop is formed almost automatically in this way. The right hand should be facing towards the tip of the suture, and it grasps the suture end, making the knot in this manner. Then the second knot is made without letting go of the suture end, and finally the third knot is made in the similar manner. If there is uh, tension on the wound edges, the first knot can be made a surgeon's knot by making a double loop. And this will act as a, a frictional barrier to spreading the edges apart. Now there is a problem that comes when you're using the needle holder as we just mentioned. And in this case, an alternate method of making the loop is required. What I usually do is to grasp the suture end with the right hand and make the loop with the right hand and grasp with the left hand which will be holding a fine forceps. So in this case what we do is grasp the suture here with the hand palm up or supinated, make the loop over here, wrap it around the left hand instrument and then pass the square knot in this way. After this we don't really need to let go. We Continue making the loops in a mirror image fashion of the usual way. Grasp it this way, cross the hands, and finally the third knot throw is made 
in this way. This technique using the right hand to grasp the suture and make the loop, as I said, is helpful when using the needle holder. When using the jeweler's forceps, which is the technique that we will demonstrate most often in the laboratory, we will grasp it and make the knot loop with the left hand. Here's the process close up. If I was using a curved jeweler's forceps in this hand, I would come and grab the suture with my left hand pronated or palm down, grasp the end of the suture, make the first throw, the second throw, and finally the third throw. On the other hand, if I was using a curved needle holder in this hand, I would grasp the suture with my hand palm up, make the first loop, the second loop, and the third loop in this manner. Now let's do some micro suturing. Here we are under the microscope and notice that the cut in the glove latex runs from away from me on the left to towards me on the right. This is the easiest position to start suturing since it's the most natural one and this is the position the glove cut should be in when you begin suturing. Now the first step is picking up the needle. Now for the experienced microsurgeon, the needle can be grasped rather easily with one hand. However, when you're first starting, it's a very frustrating chore to pick up the needle. In order to simplify this, as we discussed before, it's helpful to stabilize it with the end of the suture and then the needle can be grasped about two-thirds of the way from the end. Now you don't want the needle to be too close to the tip of the jaws because it might easily jump out. So we do want it a little bit back from the edge. Now let's go to suturing. We're going to zoom in to show the end of the latex glove here. And we want the sutures to be equally spaced from one another. The first step is to place the left hand forceps, which in this case is a number two jeweler's forceps, underneath the edge of the latex. Spread the tips a little bit and then Coming back from the edge, about one to about three needle diameters, we pass the needle, and this everts the skin edge quite nicely. Now we come straight across. We don't come obliquely across. We come straight across, and we use the forceps in order to stabilize the other side, and we pass the needle in this fashion. Notice that this side may be a little wider than this side. You should try to make the two sides about equal distance from the edge in terms of the bite. Now let's zoom out and we will look at how we retrieve the needle here. We grasp it from the edge. Don't grab the very tip of it or you can damage the fine point on the micro needle. We grab it and we gently supinate or turn our hand palm up as we rotate it and use the curve of the needle so that we don't tear the tissue. Now when we're pulling it out, we just pull it straight out and let the needle fall. Now notice that we don't have too much suture material protruding. You don't want to leave a big tail because then it would be difficult to tie. When you tie, it's going to get caught in the loop like this. We only want a little bit of tail protruding. And because I'm using the curved jeweler's forceps, we're going to use the left hand to grasp the suture material to make the loop. So we grasp it over here. We make the loop. Now notice I grasped with my hand palm down so that the suture comes this way. If I turn my hand the other way and grasp with it palm up, it is usually more difficult to make the loop. So we always grab it with the hand palm down. We make the loop, grab the end of the suture, pass it through, and in this case, it lay down quite nicely. If there's a tendency for the edges to spring apart like this, well then we can do one of two things. Either we can make a surgeon's knot on the first one and grab that, and lay it down that way and that will snug it down quite nicely or there's another technique that we'll show in a minute that can be used in order to lay the knot down and keep it from separating the wound edges. Now let's go over some of the details of actually grasping the suture end here. Okay, when we make the loop we don't want to have the right hand instrument all the way over here and then pass it over to here. There's a lot that can go wrong in the process such as the loop falling off the end of the instrument. What we like to do instead 
is first have the instrument pointing right towards the end of the suture. Then we make the loop, and all we have to do is open the forceps and grasp it. And there we are. Same thing when we grasp it on the second throw. Again, have it pointing down, and we grasp it, pass it through. And finally, on the third throw, we grasp it and pass it through. Usually, three throws should be sufficient. If necessary, occasionally, a fourth throw is required. What we then do is we cut the end of the suture, and we discard the loose end here away from our field so that it doesn't get in our way. Now let's look at an alternate way of tightening the knot when the edges are a little bit gapped open and they tend to spring apart aside from using a surgeon's knot, which is my preferred technique. But this is a nice technique also. What we do is we grasp the uh, end, we make the loop, grasp the end of the suture, and we do not tighten the first throw. We leave it loose. On the second throw, then, we grasp it. And now don't pull with your two hands together. Only pull with the right hand. This will allow the edges to slide together like this. And when you've reached the desired tightness of your ends, then bring the hands perpendicular to the wound edge, and this will cinch the knot down. Following this, a third throw is required. Now notice, here the end is a little bit too long. Watch what happens if I grasp it here and the end is left too long. See what happens is it gets hung up in the loop, and it ends up making a slip knot out of it, which then you need to fumble with to get out. Now, that's the reason for leaving the end shorter than longer. But this is a nice technique of approximating the edges when there is some tension. Now we're going to demonstrate using the needle holder instead of the curved jeweler's forceps to pass the needle. Again, we pick up the end of the suture in order to grasp the end of the needle. We will pass it in the usual manner, about three needle diameters away from the edge, everting the edges nicely, and we'll gently pass it through this way. Now, one of the reasons to use the curved needle holder to begin with for training purposes is that this can sometimes squeeze the needle too uh, vigorously and bend it or injure it. And we do not want to pick up the needle by the end, because that will certainly damage the end of the needle. Now, the difference in terms of tying is that instead of using the left hand and making the loop around the right instrument in this way, what we'll do is we're going to hold the suture here with the right hand and make the loop around the left instrument. This may seem like a trivial point, but the problem occurs in clinical microsurgery when this end is plastered down to tissue. It's very difficult to pick up the end sometimes using the needle holder, or even to make the loop using the needle holder, so it's much easier to make the loop around the fine jeweler's forceps. So what we do is we turn my right hand, palm up, grasp the end of the suture here, make the loop, pass it, make our first throw, do not let go of this, of the right hand, make the second loop, and see how easy it is to pick it up using the left hand. Now we use our technique here to tighten the edges down there. And finally, a third throw completes it. Now once you've mastered the art of sewing with the cut pointing this way in the glove, the next challenge is to change the position of the glove. And what we usually do is we turn it horizontally and start sewing towards yourself. This requires a slight change in hand position, but not very much compared to the first. Once you've mastered that, the next step is to point it so that it is going vertically. And this also requires a slight change in hand position, but not very much. The most difficult part is to sew with the obliquity facing this way, opposite from the initial one. And in this position, it's hard because you either have to squint your hand around this way and sew this way, or you have to completely turn your hand opposite and sew this way. Now, in order to get around that, a very simple technique is to change the way the needle is loaded in the forceps. And in order to do this, what we do is we load the needle backhanded, so-called backhand position, which is just like this. 
And then in this way, the jeweler's forceps comes around in the opposite way, and you pass the needle in a backhand manner, otherwise using the same technique. And this will afford you a much easier time when sewing the glove when it is facing this direction. Because unfortunately, in the operating room, we can't always rotate the patient in the position we would like them to be.